Hello and welcome back to the third part of the abdominal examination, the third and last part. Um, we're going to finish with talking about auscultation and the other special tests you can perform on the abdomen. As always, the special tests that we choose to highlight um, are not the only ones. Uh, there are many, many uh, tests you could study for the abdominal examination. These are just the ones we want you all to know now and focus on now. Um, as always, again, we're doing this. We're trying to be excellent at doing abdominal examination because we care about patients. God made them. They're super valuable, super important. And we have a high responsibility to carefully assess them and find out um, the ways in which they are having problems, the ways in which they're experiencing disease and uh, what the diagnosis and treatment should be. So with that, let's go further. So again, reminding you guys of the overall arc of the abdominal examination, we're going to make sure we position the patient appropriately, make sure the environment is comfortable. We're going to have them laying down with a pillow underneath their heads. We're going to have them in a warm room. We're going to warm our hands, et cetera, et cetera. We need privacy. We'll probably need a chaperone when we're dealing with patients of the opposite gender. Uh, then we're going to do inspection, both general overall inspection of the whole body, which is super important in every body system, but certainly very important for the abdominal examination, and then specific inspection with the abdomen exposed from the xyphosternum down to the symphysis pubis. Uh, I keep making this note that it's good to listen early, even though we're talking about it near the end. Uh, I still think it's a good practice to listen before you go pushing on the abdomen and tapping on the abdomen because it does make it easier to get a true assessment of the bowel sounds. Um, but that is different than what McLeod teaches. So that's not something I would test you on, but it's just a good bit of practical advice. And then of course we palpate, we feel the abdomen for muscle tone, for tenderness, for um, the presence of masses and being able to map out and describe those masses and decide if those masses are part of enlarged abdominal organs or whether they're uh, discrete masses, that kind of thing. And then we get down to other tests and special maneuvers. All right. So remember that warm environment with the patient supine. And in this case, we want to make sure we warm the stethoscope. You can stick it inside your coat. So where it's between your coat and your body, you could stick it inside a sweater if you're wearing one. Whatever you have to do to get that stethoscope warm is a good idea. Uh, so with auscultation, a few words. We're going to use the diaphragm of the stethoscope. We're trying to pick up those high-pitched sounds. And so the diaphragm is what you want to use, the, the wide, shallow side of the stethoscope. And then what are we listening for? Four. We're listening for bowel sounds, number one. Uh, the best place to listen is just a few centimeters to the right of the umbilicus. And ideally, you'll hear bowel sounds right away. And they're kind of normal gurgling that you get from peristalsis. Um, but, you know, if there's an obstruction, you may get very high-pitched, what we say, tinkling bowel sounds, more like a bell, very, very high-pitched. Um, and then if you're not hearing any bowel sounds, before you say, oh, there's no bowel sounds here, maybe they have an ileus, maybe they, you know, have uh, a, a, an ileus is just a paralyzed section of intestine. Um, but before you decide that's what's going on, make sure you listen for at least one minute. I know I'm saying two minutes here, at least 60 seconds and ideally for a full two minutes before you say, yep. No bowel sounds here because it really does matter. You know, an ileus is a very different situation than somebody with very slow bowel sounds. So um, make sure you know the difference when you're listening. We're also going to listen for vascular sounds. You know, they have these huge blood vessels in the abdomen, the aorta, the iliacs, the uh, renal arteries. So you want to really listen carefully for aortas. So where do you listen? Uh, I have a picture of this coming up, but you want to listen above the umbilicus for aortic bruies. And again, that's just a sound of turbulent flow like we discussed in the cardiovascular system. Uh, you have uh, a narrowing or an abnormal vessel wall and therefore um, the blood is tumbling over itself like a, uh, a whitewater rapids. And so you're getting a, a 
a whooshing, rumbling sound uh, with every pulsation. Um, you're going to listen for the renal arteries two to three centimeters above the umbilicus and lateral. So um, sort of if you went three centimeters at a 45 degree angle outward, um, that would do it. But again, go up a couple centimeters from the umbilicus and then over a couple centimeters to the right side for the right renal artery, to the left side for the left renal artery to listen for breweries there, which can be a source of high blood pressure and other disease in patients. And then if you suspect liver pathology, like a hepatoma um, or anything horrible like that, then of course you can listen over the liver also for breweries. And here's just the picture of what I'm describing. Um, you can see that spot uh, above the uh, umbilicus where we listen for the aortic uh, breweries, renal arteries left and right, or I should say left and right. Um, you can sometimes hear a venous hum from the inferior vena cava over the umbilicus. I don't really make a practice of listening for that except in very specific situations. If you needed to check for breweries of the iliacs and femoral arteries, that's where you would do it. We talked more about that in the cardiovascular examination, but nonetheless, it may be important for this. Um, Let's also say this idea of friction rub. I didn't mention it because we want to really focus on normal examination, but of course, over the um, liver and over the spleen, you could hear a friction rub, which is sort of the sound that your foot makes when you're crunching on freshly small and snow, fallen snow, they say. I don't think I can do it over the microphone, but if you kind of scrape your fingers together and put it near your ear, it's kind of that sound. And... Um, that would be a case of uh, some inflammation surrounding the liver between the liver itself and its capsule would tend to give you a friction rub and that can happen over the spleen as well. All right. Next, use the diaphragm of your stethoscope to auscultate for bowel sounds. These gurgling sounds of normal peristalsis are usually present every five to 10 seconds but you need to listen for at least two minutes before concluding that they are absent. Listen over the kidneys for the brewery of renal artery stenosis and over the liver where a brewery may be caused by hepatitis or hepatoma and over the umbilicus for an arterial brewery that might suggest an atheromatous or aneurysmal aorta. Okay, so that's how you listen, just visibly demonstrated for you, reinforcing what we just covered on the slides. Um, when it comes to special tests, let's move on to those. Remember Murphy's sign, we discussed it with palpation because it's most convenient to perform when you're palpating for the liver edge. And if you suspect gallbladder disease, like they have right upper quadrant pain, pain made worse with fatty meals, you know, that kind of thing, ask the patient to breathe in deeply, and then you're gonna push up under the right costal margin in the midclavicular line. And if your fingers make contact with the inflamed gallbladder as it comes down with uh, inspiration, then the patient will stop their breath. They will hold their inspiration. That's Murphy sign. That's that pause in breathing in is a positive Murphy sign and it indicates um, gallbladder disease. Of course, if it isn't there, it doesn't mean they don't have gallbladder disease. Um, and if it is there, it doesn't necessarily mean they have clinical gallbladder problems, but it is an indicator uh, that you can use to guide further testing and evaluation. So other special tests we haven't talked about before. Let's talk about ascites. So if you have a patient with liver disease and they have a distended abdomen, you know, distended abdomen can be for a lot of reasons. You know, there's all these Fs we talk about. So it could be fat, it could be flatus, which is gas. It could be feces, which is, you know, stool and constipation. It could be fetus as in a pregnant belly, uh, you know, all of these things. And so um, there are a lot of reasons the abdomen can be distended, but one is Fluid, another F, which is, again, ascites in the abdomen. And so to check for ascites, you're going to do a test for shifting dullness, number one. So you start, and I have a video, next slide, coming up to demonstrate this, but I'll just talk through it briefly. You're going to start and percuss from the midline to the flank. 
Just start at the umbilicus is a good place to start or just above it. And then when you get to uh, an area of dullness, you stop and leave your finger there. Then you have the patient turn onto their opposite side. So the opposite side is down on the table. You wait 10 seconds to let ascites fluid settle. Uh, in other words, for it to flow downward with gravity. And then you're going to percuss again. If the site where you percussed before and it was dull now becomes hollow sounding again, if it's resonant and the dullness is shifted, you have ascites fluid there. The other thing you can do, which is also demonstrated in the video, is there's a fluid thrill test. So you can have the patient place their hand in the middle of the abdomen, and the patient will demonstrate this in the video. You could also have an assistant, a chaperone, or somebody else in the room with you do this. Uh, you're going to put your palm, uh, your left hand palm, flat against the left side of the patient's abdomen, and you're going to flick a finger or tap with your fingers on the right side of the abdomen. Uh, with your right hand. So if you feel a ripple transmitted across the abdomen, there's ascites there. We put the patient's hand there in the midline because we want to hold the skin and subcutaneous tissues in place so that any fluid thrill that is transmitted we know is coming from ascites fluid inside the peritoneal cavity and not just being transmitted across the skin and subcutaneous fat. Okay, so let's watch that demonstration. Maybe not yet, because I forgot there's another thing that's going to be shown in the demonstration, right? So uh, this is something called a succussion splash, and it is spelled wrong on the slide. Sorry. It's succussion, S-U-C-C-U-S-S-I-O-N. Um, anyway, uh, you're going to tell the patient what you're going to do because this is kind of weird, and especially if they're having any kind of discomfort or they don't feel well. You want to make sure they know what's coming, but you're going to tell them that, okay, I'm going to put my hands uh, underneath both sides of the pelvis and lift a little bit, and then I'm going to shake you back and forth. And what I'm listening for, and you can do this with a stethoscope or just by putting your ear near the abdomen like the guy does in the video upcoming, uh, if you hear the sound of water or fluid sloshing around as a, as a water bottle might when it's half empty and you wave it around, then you're worried that they're retaining contents in their stomach. In other words, the stomach can't empty. So if you are more than four hours out from eating or drinking something and you still have the sound of splashing around when you shake the patient, um, that's not normal. It indicates delayed gastric emptying, and that could happen with gastroparesis. It could happen with uh, gastric outlet obstruction, say with pyloric stenosis, um, that kind of thing. So it's a good test to do for that. I'll be honest and say that in all the patients I've seen with pyloric stenosis or with uh, gastroparesis, I'm not sure I've ever truly detected a succussion splash, but there you go. Percusper ascites by starting in the midline okay, so and working dullness. laterally toward the flanks. In the presence of ascites, there will be dullness laterally. Can I get you to roll onto your left hand side? Turn the patient and wait a few seconds. If the note changes from dull to resonant, this is shifting dullness and indicates ascites. And could you roll back for me? And now can you place your hand down the middle of your tummy? A transmitted fluid thrill is another way to demonstrate gross ascites. Here the patient's hand test. prevents transmission of the impulse through this. Warn the patient about testing for a succussion splash. Succussion I'm going splash. to give your tummy a shake. An audible splash more than four hours after oral intake indicates delayed gastric emptying due either to gastric outlet obstruction or gastroparesis. And notice he finishes the exam by lowering the shirt and protecting the patient's privacy. So what comes next? No more lectures. You've done all three lectures that are required for the abdominal examination part. Of course, still remember that digital rectal examination and hernia examination are important parts of the gastrointestinal examination. So we have other lectures on those. Um, but now what do you want to do? You want to study this video the slides that go along with it, and you want to practice. You need to find someone with whom you can practice going through the steps. Uh, you're going to do 
the general inspection followed by the specific inspection. Maybe you auscultate at that point. You're feeling, you're listening for bowel sounds. You're listening for uh, vascular bruits. You're going to move into palpation where you're feeling for uh, tenderness, starting away from the site of pain and moving towards it. You're feeling for muscle tone. You're feeling for masses. You're feeling for organomegaly. Um, you're feeling for uh, exactly where is the liver edge. Perhaps you are looking for Murphy's sign because you suspect a gallbladder disease. Then you're going to move to percussion where you can percuss the liver span. You can percuss looking for the spleen. You can even percuss looking for the bladder and things which we didn't talk about because it has to do more with the genitourinary system. But of course, if you're doing an abdominal examination, maybe it's not a GI problem. Maybe it's a genitourinary problem. So keep that in mind. And then uh, lastly, we have all the special tests that we discovered uh, or we discussed, like uh, Murphy sign from before, shifting dullness, fluid thrill, both of those looking for ascites, and then the succussion splash. So study up. Ask questions of us if you need to. Read McLeod's to help clarify things if you need to. And uh, thank you for paying attention to these videos.